Hello and welcome to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm your host, Ian Harditson. Today, tonight, coming to you from a Tuesday afternoon in Columbus, Ohio, 7.14 p.m. Eastern Time Record. We'll be breaking down all 14 Week 6 matches with a focus on providing you all with some actual fantasy football takeaways. Hope everyone had a great time watching some football. Tuesday night game, I'm going to catch, the, catch up on that uh, starting halftime. Wild times we're living in, but a whole lot of fun games, unfortunate injuries as always, but we are on to Week 6. Uh, almost as always, every other week. Week we have him on the show, but joining me today is PFF and Establish the Run analyst Dwayne McFarland. Dwayne, how's it going, man? Dude, I'm doing so good. I mean, in a weird way, it's like this is a terrible season, but we're getting Tuesday night football. Even though these most of these players aren't in my lineups because I benched them, but I'm, <laughs> I still have I have football on. It's a Tuesday night, so you know I can't complain again. Uh, before the show, Dwayne was kind of beating himself up about not quite optimizing the roster decisions, and I told him, as I'm going to tell all you all of you out there. It's okay. It's a weird season. Hindsight's twenty twenty. Don't beat yourself up too much if you decide not to start. Uh, or, you know, PFF's favorite quarterback out there, Josh Allen tonight, and he ends up going off. So we'll see what happens, but on to the podcast at hand. So as we go through the games, I'll list the matchup. Spread and game total. Note that, you know, with some of these games going on, quarterback situation is unclear. Don't have data for every game, but Dwayne and I will then each give a fantasy take and we'll move on to the next one. Still plenty of time throughout the week to more f- fully form our opinions, so make sure you check out uh, our content on PFF.com throughout the week but this will be a good way to get familiar with the week and learn some helpful fantasy nuggets as we go so starting off we got the texans at the titans uh titans seem to be opening up as five and a half point favorites uh we'll see how that changes after this game uh finishes up but i want to talk about will fuller season because one of the uh you know usually do these podcasts and maybe the social media team clips off a quote or two or maybe a little video and the one last week was uh, how i said that you know will fuller only wide receiver you can really trust on this team right now and i got freaking lit into by all you Twitter people out there. This one did work out for me in a season of many social media L's. I did catch a W here. And look, it's just Will Fuller. When he is healthy, we need to be trotting him out there as the borderline wide receiver one to upside wide receiver two that he's been all season. Week one, he goes eight catches, 112 yards, uh, has the you know infamous goose egg. And week two, that was hamstring influenced. Since then, though, we've seen four catches, 54 yards in the score, six catches, 108 yards in the score, and four catches, 58 yards in the score. At least five targets in all these games, except the goose egg. It's Will Fuller's season, and the last thing I'll bring up with the passing game, and we saw the good Cooks game. I think we know it's going to be a little bit boomer bust. Randall Cobb's uh, average target depth is just so low, we can't even worry about it. The tight end position, though, is actually clearing up because Jordan Akins missed last week uh, dealing with an ankle injury. Was also, uh, I think he's finally out of the concussion protocol, but has had that going on, and that enabled Darren Fellows to post a season-high 86% uh, snap rate. I know the 44-yard touchdown was pretty fluky. He had some busted coverage in there, but truly, you know, I think if you give Deshaun Watson or Russell Wilson, I think of them the same life. If we could just give them one tight end out there, that guy's a threat for double-digit touchdowns on a 16-game season, 16-game pace. So keep an eye on Will Fuller, as always, and also uh, Darren Fells this week. Dwayne, what do you got on the Titans? Yeah, man, for the Titans, it's pretty, you know, simple for me. People know, I mean, you're going to let the big dog run. You're going to get Derrick Henry in any matchup, but I'm really excited, man. It's actually starting tonight, but it could be A.J. Brown season. And so the thing to remember with the Titans is just it's an elite opportunity for whatever wide receivers are out there from a standpoint of they use a ton of play action. So, I mean, this season they've used 33%, 43%, 39% play action in their games. If you're the receiver that's on the other end of that, which A.J. Brown was often last year, that's a huge part of the recipe um, that creates those wide open looks for him. And then you guys know what A.J. Brown can do after the catch, especially on those 10, 15, 17 yard ends. I mean, he can just take any one of those plays to the house. So, be ready to get A.J. Brown back in your lineups if he's not already back in there tonight. Um, the, the other thing I would say that could be really good here, Ian, is the fact that we're still seeing the play action. And we talked about this a little, I think, on maybe on the week two show. But the Titans are running far more plays than what they've run in the past. So they've ran 81, 62, and 75 plays. You have games last year, man, where they're running like 50 plays. And their defense just doesn't appear to be able to stop anyone. So the cool thing, though, is that Arthur Smith – unlike some other coaches, doesn't freak out and think, oh, we're behind, play action doesn't work. No, it still works. So now you're going to get this combination of more plays, plus the play action is still intact, and it's always a threat because they still will hand it to Derrick Henry even when they're down. So I'm super excited about A.J. Brown's season. If you can buy low, folks, go buy low. Of course, he's playing tonight. He'll probably go off, so you'll just erase this part of the of, of the uh, recording. 100% agree, and in the near future especially, look, this is not a crowded passing game, and I think we all expect A.J. Brown to be the outright number one target, regardless of who's active, but with Corey Davis and Adam Humphreys on the COVID list at the moment, things are that much clearer for A.J. 
be to get that wide receiver one season going that we've been hoping for for quite some time on this podcast. Next matchup, we've got the Washington football team at the New York football Giants. Giants coming in as three-point favorites, and the over-under is down from 44.5 to about 43. So, uh, yeah, the Washington football team offense. My goodness, I think we all can agree Alex Smith is a fantastic story, given the comeback player of the year right now. But it's going to be rough for Terry McLaurin if this sort of quarterback play keeps up. I am cautiously optimistic, though, that we're going to continue to see McLaurin function as a top 20 wide receiver more weeks than not. We were having the same conversation with him last year. What's going to happen when Case Keenum isn't under center? And now this year, what's going to happen when Dwayne Haskins isn't is, uh, is under center? It's We're looking at like Allen Robinson 2.0 coming up in terms of just the off, one awful quarterback after another. It's unfortunate we have this problem. I would love to you know have a future uh, or just a consistent all pro under center and not have to worry about McLaurin. He's just going off week after week after week. But you know I do think just because he is the undisputed number one in this passing game, as bad as last week was, and I cannot stress how awful that performance was, we still do have you know near t- near term evidence of Kyle Allen enabling DJ Moore at top twenty heights last year, and even Alex Smith like that was his first game after that horrific injury. We're gonna see slightly better performances moving forward. Washington is gonna throw for more than seventy yards in future football games. I'm really going out on a limb with that statement there, but uh, if, if it was a more crowded offense, I'd be more concerned. But for now, I don't think we need to you know freak out about McLaurin, try to sell low on him or anything like that. Still one of the more talented receivers. I think in the league and he's going to have enough volume I think to make up for it this matchup not ideal shout out James Bradbury PFF's number two uh, cornerback this year he has shadowed Allen Robinson Kendrick Bourne and Amari Cooper no touchdowns to any of those guys and Kendrick Bourne was the only one to clear him 50 yards so not a great matchup you know if you have a pretty stacked team and McLaurin's odd man out I get it but not a guy that I'm expecting to completely dud for the rest of the season Dwayne what you got on the Giants yeah man it's almost like an exact parallel you know Dare I say, really, Darius Slayton is like arbitrage Terry McLaurin. I mean, if you look at it, eight targets, six targets, six targets, seven targets, 11 targets, but he's got the same issue. We've got a quarterback issue with Daniel Jones. Things just really aren't looking good. You know, he showed a little bit of a spark last year. Uh, started off with some really rough matchups, but you if you were expecting Daniel Jones to get going, you certainly were hoping that against the sieve that is known as the Cowboys defense, that it would happen, right? The Cowboys are giving up everything like the most you know they're in the tops you know as far as giving up open looks in air yards giving up open looks against play action I mean it's all there for the taking against the Cowboys and they just couldn't you know get everything going now Slayton again kind of like what you're talking about with McLaurin I mean he didn't he didn't kill you but it's just it's kind of it's so dissatisfying because you're sitting there and you're watching it you're like wow this could be so much more this could really be more and Slayton was a guy that I was off of a little bit in the preseason, but it was mostly because I just wasn't the believer in Daniel Jones in the early season schedule. But now that I'm getting to actually watch him more, like the, I really do think he's a good player. It's just unfortunate that he's stuck, you know, where that he's at. And it's a really the same thing for Evan Ingram, man. Yeah. I mean, if you look at Evan Ingram running a route on 83% of routes, that's elite, you know, for a tight end. You know, I mean, it's just a situation where, again, you have a quarterback that can't get it there. I mean, he's got 15% of the tar- 15% of uh, the targets per route, but 19% of the targets on the season. So, I mean, there's going to be volume there for Ingram and for Slayton. Otherwise, you're just avoiding this offense. Freeman saw a slight tick up, you know, in his utilization, 61% of the attempts up from 50%, but he's still not the guy on the passing downs. He's getting a little more passing work, but that's Deion Lewis. So you're just kind of, you're really just steering clear, you know, of the Giants as much as you can. But if you've got to plug a guy in from the Giants, it's going to be Darius Slayton or Evan Ingram. You know they had the rough start in the season. Last week was when things were supposed to get on track, and they did not. Slayton did have a touchdown uh, overturned on a pretty ticky tacky uh, OPI, in my opinion. But either way, man, I'm, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, yeah. And it, for what it's worth, you know they get another great matchup. Yes, the you know Washington has a better front, you know seven, you know yeah. than what the Cowboys have by far. But as of last week, and I haven't reran this yet, but as of last week, no team was giving up more. Um, open looks, which means two steps of separation or more, right, on these plays that are, you know, deep down the field, on these 20-yard shots down the field. So that's definitely within Slayton's wheelhouse. It should at least keep him in play, you know, as a wide receiver three, and he could still go off as, you know, one of these guys in a DFS tournament that could really make your day. 
Nobody's been under more pressure than Daniel Jones this season, but if they can just keep him upright for a little bit, certainly does have a secondary he can attack. Uh, moving on here, we got the Falcons at the Vikings. Vikings are setting at three and a half point favorites. Game total is at 55 and a half. So Todd Gurley, man, it, the guy's playing well. And I, I look, the rushing lanes are pretty wide out there, but at some point we got to give the dude credit. I think we all kind of expected him to come in this year, wash after we saw last season. I mean, it was awful, but here we are through five weeks and Gurley is averaging career high. 0.2 missed force tackles per attempt, uh, career high 3.5 yards after contact uh, per carry. I mean, just looking at the yards per carry mark, he's at 4.8. That's what we saw in 2018, 2017, 2015. I mean, last year he was down to four in 2016, the Jeff Fisher year was 3.2. So truly, we are seeing a guy that was almost as efficient uh, as he was during his heyday. Now, the big problem with why you know we shouldn't be expecting this to, one, continue, and two, just to result in this RB1 uh, type of production, he's not getting any of the receiving work. I mean, you just mentioned it for Devontae Freeman. It's pretty similar here with Todd Gurley, where even last week, uh, you know, 57% snaps, 14 carries, five targets, which was good to see. But uh, we saw Brian Hill and Edo Smith also plenty involved uh, behind him. So in these games this year, where even when they've gotten up a lot, we just haven't seen Gurley have this game, you know, a 75, 80% snap rate. And that was really why I was off him in the offseason, because even with uh, Devontae Freeman, Tevin Coleman there over the years, there was just never a situation where they would feed one guy all the work unless injuries called for it. So uh, Gurley. Gurley, you know, he's playing well. I think it's been a little bit schedule-induced, but you look at him moving forward, and he is going to have another matchup here with the Panthers again soon, then Vikings and Lions uh, before that. So, hey, if he's on the squad, you know, someone d is buying, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid and thinks he's back to normal, uh, I, I would try to, you know, sell him if you can. But at the same time, you know, with the way he's playing right now in the Falcons offense, I can't get much worse. Uh, you can continue to fire him up as, you know, kind of a upside RB2, which I think is more than a lot of us uh, gave him credit for. So good job by you, Todd. Uh, Dwayne. What do you got on the Vikings? Yeah, one nice thing on Gurley is he actually did see a slight uptick, you know, in his usage on long down and distance as well. But it's like you said, it's still it's still a bit of a nightmare overall. Um, as far as the Vikings go, I mean, everybody knows. I mean, Madison's going to be the guy this week. Dalvin Cook's going to be out. Um, they're going to get a bye week after that. So we could see Cook return, you know, after that. Um, but they'll they'll want to be careful with it. But the Vikings season is like it's teetering on the brink, you know, after that close loss on they really needed the win, you know, against the Seahawks, you know, on um, Monday night or sorry, Sunday night just didn't come through. Um, so Madison will be in play this week. Obviously, most people know, you know, you're going to be putting him in you know, as an RB1 in this matchup. He's playing the Vikings. Um, so I think he's easy in the Lily, top shut up. backs this week in this offense. The other thing just to throw at you guys, um, Irv Smith, just keep an eye on Irv Smith. So he jumped to a season high and routes 73% this last week. He was a guy that, you know, some of us had some hope for. You know, he's a second-year guy out of Alabama. He's an athletic tight end. He's in a scheme that uses play action. He's plays in the same kind of scheme as George Kittle. So he gets mismatches all day against linebackers and safeties. He's never going to see a ton of volume, even if he's running like 75, 80% of the routes, because this is a low volume pass offense, but everything's tied to play actions, tied to the running game. And so you don't need as many targets while Kittle still gets, you know, a crazy like 15. You just don't typically see that. But even if he gets, you know, four to six, you know, he could start to show value. Um, but the guy that I'm the most excited about still, obviously, outside of Adam Thielen, everybody knows Adam Thielen's, you know, wide receiver one, and hopefully you drafted him as such, as pretty much I think most people at, at, at PFF told everyone to do that. Um, man, it's just Justin Jefferson, you know, Ian. Yeah, he didn't come up huge in the box in the box score this past week. But, I mean, 95%, you know, of the routes, 14% of the targets, which was still, you know, five, it's not great. But, again, these are these are really good targets. These are targets that are coming off of play action. These are targets that give you a chance to run after the catch and mismatches. So, I mean, um, I'm excited about Justin Jefferson. And I think, he's a, I think he's a guy that you can plug in, you know, against the Falcons this weekend, you know, as a wide receiver too. You already talked about, you know, the points that are going to be scored in the game. So this will be a game that a lot of players are going to be on, but these, these should all definitely be in your lineups, you know, as far as, you know, your, uh, your, your home leagues or whether you're in season long. Irv Smith is really storm, still more of a dart throw. He's a guy just to kind of keep your eye on. But I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if he comes up with 60 yards, you know, and a touchdown on four or five catches um, if he continues to see this kind of work. 
Obviously, run first offense is not ideal for our pass catchers, but if it's a situation like the Vikings where it is condensed between two guys at the top and they have a quarterback in Kirk Cousins willing to throw the ball down the field, we can get behind that, particularly in a great matchup, as you mentioned. Uh, moving on, just exhilarating one here. Jets at Dolphins was supposed to be Jets and Chargers. Uh, got a little bit changed up. Couldn't find a line on this one, so uh, let me know if one's out there, uh, people. But yeah, it is Jameson Crowder's world, and we are all just living in it. Say what you will about Adam Gase and you know all the players that that leave the Jets and seem to go ball out anywhere else. The man knows how to enable a fancy friendly slot receiver. We saw it, you know, when he was allegedly the offensive coordinator for the Peyton, Peyton teams, uh, Wes Walker putting up numbers. Eddie Royal added average 5.6 targets per game in 2015. Jarvis Landry uh, got his start in Miami uh, with Adam Gase calling plays. Even saw Danny Amendola in 2018 get a nice little uptick when Gase uh, was calling plays for him. So Crowder, 11 targets per game this season. Uh, shout out to my guy, John Daigle from Roto World pulling this one up. Only Devontae Adams is averaging more fantasy points per game at the wide receiver position than Crowder through five weeks. It's pretty funny how, you know, he has all these weeks, and I'm guilty of it myself, and we just kind of keep slotting him back into that wide receiver three range. So, you know, we can put him in the lineup. Okay. No. Enough is enough, everyone. I know it's weird, but we got to accept that Jameson Crowder is a legit upside wide receiver two here moving forward. The Jets cannot do anything right except feed their slot receiver and pretty underwhelming talent not to hate on Jameson Crowder that much but you know all, by all accounts not the most gifted receiver in the league whatever they're feeding him the ball it is working it doesn't matter if it's Flacco it doesn't matter if it's Donald uh, D Donald they are getting in the ball and in this match specifically uh, you know you look at Byron Jones Zavin Howard obviously not great matchups on the outside but Crowder will be continuing to work from the friendly confines of the slot so Chris Herndon hasn't worked Le'Veon Bell apparently they're trying to trade him as is every other fantasy manager out there trust Jameson Crowder and that is it from the Jets Dwayne where you got on the Dolphins yeah, I mean, maybe you couldn't find a line because it's just zero. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it broke, you know, all of the machines. It, it broke It broke anything that tried to post it. So, um, you know, as far as the, the Dolphins go, you know, it's really a two-man show, I would say. You know, in the passing game, you've got Devontae Parker and you've got Mike Gusecki. A lot of people were down on Gusecki last week um, because that's just how the tight end, that's how the tight end world works, man. You know, you're going to have some of these boom-bust weeks. It's really hard to find guys that, you know, every single week can do it. Um, for you. I mean, even even guys like we'll talk about later, like Zach Ertz are struggling this year. But Gasecki is a guy that just know he's always out there enough. He's running plenty of routes and he has an opportunity to go off, you know, in any given game. And then we saw that last week. So he's always going to be in play. Um, the safety and linebacker play for the Jets is not anything to write home about, um, you know, whenever it comes to covering uh, folks in the passing game. Um, as far as you know, Parker goes, I mean, I think he's still the alpha. He's out there all the time. I mean, basically they got up, you know, on the 49ers. That's so weird. The Dolphins got so far up on the 49ers, they could just <laughs> let their foot off the gas. It's like, what world are we living in? Um, but Preston Williams did get a little bit more involved, so just keep an eye on that. You know, he started off the season uh, with a route rate of 97%, and that eventually dipped down all the way to 61%. This last week, it came back up to 79%, and he actually led the team you know, in air yards with 116. So Williams is a guy you can also keep an eye on. Of course, we want to keep Fitzpatrick in there because he's the guy that no matter what, he'll just drop back and sling it to this guy. I have no I have no idea what it's going to mean once we see Tua. Um, but again, I don't expect a huge shootout, shootout here, but each one of these guys has viable, uh, you know, they have viable matchups. Um, so any one of them, if you've got a plug in, you know, Parker, if you've got a plug in, you know, Gasecki, I think you're fine in most format formats. Williams is still a guy I wouldn't trust unless I'm in a really, really deep format or if you're looking for a pump play in DFS. Hey, Dwayne, I, uh, I pulled up the box score of Bill's Titans while you were talking and Ryan Tano has completed two passes, both to AJ Brown for 27 yards and a touchdown. It's happening. Boom. AJB, wide receiver, one season. You heard it from the future teller himself, uh, Dwayne, earlier on this podcast. Hey, hey, I got him I got him in the captain in the showdown and five lineups. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it, man. All right, before we keep going, a uh, quick shout out to a fellow PFF podcast. PFF and Sunday Night Football's Chris Collinsworth is teaming up with one of the best players on and off the field, 49ers All-Pro corner Richard Sherman. The Chris Collinsworth podcast featuring Richard Sherman is available now wherever you find your podcast. They will provide the most interesting football conversation in sports every single week. And so Sometimes that means the discussion will venture off the field too. Additionally, Chris will be taking a dive into the game of football as he sees it, inviting in the best and brightest to talk about everything that is happening in the great game of football. Mark your calendars. You do not want to miss the best 60 minutes of insight this season. So please go check out the Chris Collinsworth podcast featuring Richard Sherman. Uh, moving on with our game-by-game -game preview here on the PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. We go on to the Bears at the Panthers. Carolina sitting as two and a half point favorites game total at 44. So David Montgomery 
has not had you know particularly easy matchups over the last two weeks with Buccaneers uh, and the Colts, but things are looking up. And you know he did actually overcome you know lack of rushing efficiency last week with this newfound target share. Eight targets for Dave Montgomery in one game. It's happening, people. Uh, and you know I'm, I'm watching him, and I, I've, I've said you know good things about Montgomery throughout the season. He is you know popping with the advanced metrics a little bit and yards after contact, missed forced tackles per attempt. At a minimum, it's been a big upgrade than what we've seen last season. Now look. I'm watching the games too. I realize this guy does not have the type of burst and not, you know, big playability is not there for him or really anyone else uh, in this offense, not named Allen Robinson. So not saying this guy's going to be a world beater, but at some point with this type of usage, we don't even need him to be a world beater because he is playing over 80% of the offensive snaps. He's only getting, you know, last week he only had 10 carries, but we're going to see that increase if they get some sort of a positive game script. And my guy Cordero Patterson, unfortunately, he's just, you know, never going to get more than a handful of touches per game. So Montgomery is the true featured back. They're coming comfortable throwing him to the ball as they should be. I mean, he's got soft enough hands. It's not like he's out there blowing every opportunity he has uh, in the passing game, like a Ronald Jones or something like that. So, you know, Montgomery, he's making the most out of his pass game opportunities. He's going to continue to get them because they refuse to go with anyone else. So, uh, you know, in this matchup, okay, let's do it because only Kenyon Drake is the per- only running back in the league. Apparently that can't go off against the Carolina Panthers. I think this could be the week that Montgomery, you know, even with this usage actually mixes in maybe, maybe just maybe a big play or two as well. So good to see some, one uh, emerge as a, as a viable fantasy option in this Bears offense other than A-Rob. Uh, Dwayne, what do you got on the Panthers, bro? Ian, give me Robbie Anderson's target totals for 500, please. <laughs> Is that the daily double? <laughs> 8, 10, 5, 11, 13. Like, I'm, you know, I, you know, he and Bridgewater had like a cup of coffee together before Bridgewater got traded to the Saints. You know, the Saints signed Bridgewater, if you guys remember. Then they drafted Sam Darnold, and Teddy's like, this isn't what I'm here for. In classic Jets fashion, they ship him off. The Saints are like, we need a backup to Drew Brees, and I guess he found that as a you know something he would rather do, which why wouldn't you rather do that than <laughs> hanging around with the Jets? But evidently, in that short span, Ian, these two guys became like, you know, soulmates <laughs> because – he has complete eyes for Robbie Anderson. I did not see this coming. I love Robbie Anderson. We knew he was in Adam Gase jail, but man, the targets that this guy is seeing, 28% of the targets on the season. DJ Moore is at 22%. And DJ Moore is still out there, plenty. DJ Moore is still leading the team in routes. He's leading the team in end zone targets. He's leading the team in play action targets. So I know a lot of people are like, hey, is it DJ Moore sell season? My answer is no. Why would you right now? Unless you really think that, you know, uh, you know, his touchdown last week makes him all of a sudden, you know, a really hot commodity to everybody. Most likely you drafted him in the fourth or fifth round of your fantasy draft and he's still wide receiver 24. So, I mean, I think there's still upside for DJ Moore. Um, but I mean, Robbie Anderson, man, it's just like, okay, I, I, I give in. He's, he's a wide receiver <laughs> one. We've got to look at him like that the rest of the way. I think DJ Moore is a low end wide receiver two, but I would not be surprised as defenses start to shift. You know, if you guys, you think about the way the NFL scouts, the way they get ready for these games, they're typically looking back three to four games at a, at a time. And that's, so when they're watching film, all of a sudden now it's going to be, who's, look at Robbie Anderson. Like, it honestly, it take teams like live in this weird bubble. They don't watch stats and stuff like we do. They literally go and they watch film. That's why you'll hear players talk about another team. They, they literally won't know the guy's name. They'll be like, oh yeah, 21 is good. Why do they do that? Because they've been watching his film all week. And they're like, oh yeah, that Zeke Elliott, you know, he can pass block or whatever the case may be. Um, so whenever you think about a guy like DJ Moore, if you're wanting to sell, if he's just got you scared, just don't do it yet. He's going to have bigger games coming and he could still, this could still end up in my opinion, Ian, and I want your thoughts on this one because, you know, I was a DJ Moore truther, so I'm trying to make sure I'm not blind to this. But, I mean, I think there's still a chance that this is a true 1A, 1B scenario. And if teams start to pay more attention to Robbie Anderson, we know what DJ Moore can do. He showed you a flash of that this last week. I mean, the guy catches the ball and just runs away from everybody, right? Yeah. Um, now, I get it. They were playing the Falcons, which a lot of people do that. But it's still, he's still an impressive player. He's a young player. He's done a lot. And this is an ascending passing game. I think there's room for more than one option. What are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I'm with you. I mean, clearly this is different than what we anticipated coming into the year. We were thinking DJ Moore, Alpha One, Robbie, you know, his usual kind of just field stretcher role, and Curtis Samuel maybe being this, you know, high volume, lower ADOT guy out of the slot. We've seen Curtis just not be, you know, consistently involved in the passing game at all because in this new offense, Teddy, he's free to throw down field a little bit more and do his thing and work, you know, along whatever Joe Brady wants him to do, which has been fantastic. So while it's weird to not see Robbie as a field stretcher and actually see DJ Moore being the one racking up air yards and all 
all that, you know, it's okay. Cause again, it's one, a one B extending passing game. They can enable more than one fancy relevant wide receiver. So while Robbie is a surprise, DJ is going to be okay. So I'm with you, man. It's, you know, we, we didn't get the week uh, four big breakout game, but week five, pretty nice. And I still think plenty of better days to come for DJ Moore. Um, next game, Lions at the Jaguars. Lions opened at two and a half. That's up to three and a half game total sitting at 54. So good news, everyone. Matthew Stafford has resumed throwing the ball downfield. We did not see this to start the season. And it kind of made sense why we didn't see it. You know, when Kenny Galladay is not in there, you got to adjust your offense. You got to adjust your team. Uh, a few too many carries uh, up the middle to Adrian Peterson for my liking, but we have seen the average target depth increase after Galladay got back. It was only 9.3 yards in week one, 8.8 yards week two. We've seen it go to 10.2 and most recently 13.3 yards uh, with Galladay back in action. So expecting him to be healthier than ever coming off the bye. And oh my goodness, we look at this uh, schedule coming up for the Lions. We got the Jaguars and the Falcons and the Colts and the Vikings and the football team, then the Panthers and the Texans. That takes us through week 12. I mean, these are all uh, potentially startable games for Stafford. And, you know, it was a situation last year where he was such a high-performing fantasy quarterback, I believe, largely in part thanks to this gunslinger mentality. So if he's got that back, if they, you know, take the foot off the gas, the Adrian Peterson experiment just a little bit, I do think uh, Stafford can emerge as a borderline QB1 here moving forward. I would certainly take Stafford over Andy Dalton uh, moving forward. Uh, Dwayne, are you with me on Stafford over Dalton? And then hit me with some Jaguars goodness. Yeah, man, absolutely. And, and we'll talk some more about Dalton here in just a bit, you know, and I like him, but I have some concerns. But if I have an opportunity, I'm still sticking, you know, with Stafford. I, I'm like you. I don't think we've seen the best from the Lions offense. You just talked about the schedule. So I'm I'm 100 percent down with it. I'm also still down with TJ Hawkinson, who is really running more routes than he ever has before. So he's a guy that he could literally be phasing out Marvin Jones. So just you guys keep an eye on that. If for some reason, you know, in some of these smaller leagues, somebody may have dropped TJ Hawkinson due to the bye week, you should sweep, you know, swoop in, scoop him up, add him to the roster. You're going to feel good about it. As far as the Jaguars go, uh, we'll have to see what's going on with DJ Chark. You know, um, he didn't finish the game this last week, just after he had finally gotten going, you know, in. Um, now the Lions should should be healthy again at cornerback this week. We just haven't seen the Lions with a fully healthy secondary. So we're not quite sure what their pass defense will look like whenever it's operating as it should. But up until now, you know, it hasn't been that stiff of competition. So we'll have to keep an eye an, an eye on Chark. Um, the guy I would hit on here is really just James Robinson. I know last week he didn't come through with a big stat line. And I, I just was watching Twitter because apparently it was trade for James Robinson week because everybody all of a sudden got convinced and everybody <laughs> traded for him. Then he didn't have this big week. And everybody's like, oh my gosh, people told me to trade for James Robinson and he sucks. No, he doesn't. He's still fine. He's on the field plenty. Um, you know, you're just not going to score, you know, 20 points every single week, you know, in fantasy football. That's just not the way it goes. Um, he's still going to be on par um, with your Josh Jacobs. He's going to be on par with your Joe Mixons. I'm not saying the guy's as talented as them. Maybe he is. We don't know enough about him yet. But obviously, those guys, we, we know their pedigree. We know how good they are. But at the same time, he's in the same kind of role. You know, he is getting all the early down work. And oh, by the way, he, for the second week in a row, Ian, he got 50% of the two-minute offense. That normally belongs to Chris Thompson. So while the game script didn't quite work out the right way um, for James Robinson last week, he's still in a situation where he's 100%, you know, really the lead guy in this offense. Yes, Chris Thompson gets a little bit of the work, but he's still chipping away at that. And so for me, I think James, Tom, uh, James Robinson still has upside, and I think he's fine in this week's matchup. I like him as an RB2 with RB1, RB1 upside in most matchups for the rest of the season. Yeah, I agree with you there. Definitely not a week to worry about. I was looking up just on Twitter today trying to find anything on Raquel Armstead or Zigbo, seeing if they were going to come back and – Honestly, nothing, man. Sounds like, you know, Armstead <laughs> might be out for the whole have, year. Well. And uh, yeah, exactly, man. So until we hear like some whispering about this, even once they're back, I mean, I don't think they're necessarily going to uh, take Robinson off the field like all that much at all, if 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 at all, because he's playing so well. But yeah, uh, it's not a concern right now. So if anyone hears something out there, uh, let Dwayne and I know because we cannot find anything on that situation. Uh, moving on, we got a fun one here. Browns at the Steelers. Uh, Steelers open five and a half, down to three and a half. The uh, Sharps are apparently out there. Uh, uh, with Baker Mayfield and company game total sitting even at 51. So I want to talk about this backfield, you know, it was obviously a big topic of discussion last week and everyone, uh, you know, wondering if Deonis Johnson was worth that top waiver ad. And yeah, the answer is pretty much what we told you. No, he's not because the best case scenario was always as this, you know, maybe one B while Kareem Hunt remains hurt, but Hunt did not enter the game with an injury designation was still limited with the groin thing, but came in fresh, came in great, looked good. And, you know, okay, good news for Deonis 
awareness of, you know, not much there, but Domshaw Hurd was out of the picture. So we do know Johnson is the clear lead back uh, behind Kareem Hunt. But yeah, we're going to need to see an injury to Kareem, like a further injury to literally take him off the field before Dearness Johnson is anything uh, resembling, you know, a, a viable fantasy option. So, you know, the split came out like 70-30, but honestly, it was wider than that. We're looking at a potential Kareem Hunt just complete takeover situation because he started cramping in the fourth quarter and then Johnson got six of his eight carries uh, after that point. So if we get a game here where the Browns, you know, are in a competitive game script, uh, I think we can see Kareem just really uh, take over. Right now, man, I mean, it's it's weird with the, you know, game still going on tonight and everything, but uh, once rankings are out there, he is definitely going to be in my top five, if not the top three, playing as well as ever. It's a tough matchup for sure, but, you know, when we have someone that is not going to leave the field, can do just as much in the pass game as he can the run game, uh, I think we can get behind Kareem Hunt despite, uh, you know, facing the steel curtain defense. Defense. Dwayne, where you got on the Steelers? Yeah, man, just quickly on Hunt, I'm with you. I, I think, you know, if you look at over the next three weeks, there's probably at least one of those weeks, I won't, he's going to probably end up as the RB1 overall in fantasy football for the week. I think he's a top five play every week. This is a yeah. great, you know, rushing attack. He's a great talent. You know, obviously Nick Chubb is elite as well, but with this all being his, um, you know, people can see more about it in the utilization report. I actually broke down, you know, everything about his role, long down and distance, um, you know, broke down his two minute drill is inside the five work as long, along with the, uh, with the Ernest Johnson. So you guys can find that, you know, on the site over at PFF. Um, but as far as, you know, the Steelers go, I mean, really, is there anybody else to talk about besides Chase Claypool? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like, what in the heck, Ian? Like, this is insane. I mean, rookie receivers, honestly, are going to come in to play huge this fantasy season. I mean, somebody's going to – I mean, there are going to be championships won based on some of these performances that these rookie receivers are are putting up. And I'm here for it. You know, I love these guys. So, Claypool, though, I mean, you know, he goes out. You know, I mean, he scores 42.6 points in a PPR league. Uh, you know, seven receptions, 110 yards, three touchdowns, 11 targets. Oh, yeah, he had a rushing touchdown. Oh, yeah, he also had another receiving touchdown. Call back on an offensive pass interference. Bad call, too. I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, the guy – and you just see Ben just growing his trust in the guy. It's basically like, ah, Claypool's got two guys, just chunk it over there. It's like, what? It doesn't matter. So I'm very interested to see what's going to happen. You know, Deontay Johnson started off the week, um, you know, as basically, you know, um, Tomlin came out today and said, well, we'll see. He's kind of day to day. Um, it looked like he was going to be a, he'll probably be a limited participant, you know, tomorrow. You know, it was a direct blow to the back, I think was the way they labeled it, which was kind of a weird, you know, I don't, I don't know if he has a bruised back. I, I have no clue. They haven't said literally what his injury is. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes some of these teams, you know, they want to keep it under wraps. But, you know, when Johnson comes back, I, you know, I really dug into this. He probably keeps his role looking at what his role is in the offense, right? You know, he is the route runner. He is the separator. He's the guy that gives you that element, right? And then when you think about Juju, he's going to be playing in the slot. So he's going to be out there. So it really still comes down probably to Claypool. You know, Ian, I want your thoughts here because it's so, this is one of those situations that's so hard. Um, because the Steelers, they use 11 personnel quite a bit, but it's more like the league average. It's not like they trot three receivers out there all the time. And when Deontay Johnson has been available, it's really been Claypool slightly edging out James Washington for that third receiver role. So when you have a team that's running on you know, the NFL average for three wide receiver sets, and then you're getting maybe 60% of that work and having to give 40% to another player, it's really not a great situation where you're going to be able to predict. But on the other hand, you have this blow up performance. You know, he's obviously a player that, you know, they know they can get involved in the offense and he can reward them. You know, here's, he's a great, this is a great example of, he's got 14% of the targets on the season, Ian, but he averages 23% targets per route. So when he's on the field, this is a guy they're designing things around. The other thing that tells you is, man, if it ever does really become his role and they just kind of say, hey, James Washington, that's nice, but you just you kind of go sit over here. We'll keep you as a backup. Who knows? Somebody else could get hurt. Because this last weekend, it was Washington that took over for Deontay Johnson. He played almost 90% you know, of the snaps. Claypool only ran around on 67% of routes, but he still dominated. So it's really, a for me, I'm looking at Claypool still as a wide receiver wide receiver three right now. And, you know, maybe he, to, to use a classic Ian line, hope maybe he's boom, boom, you know, there's no <laughs> boom bust, but I mean, he's a guy you just want to get behind. But when I look at the utilization, I'm like, man, I got to kind of, I got to keep him in that wide, re wide receiver three mode. But every once in a while, Ian, we have these years where a guy, even though he's not seeing the field enough, they just still blow up. And you know, it's hard to predict when it's going to happen, but in your mind is that Claypool. 
It reminds me of AJ Brown last year where the snaps weren't really there. The targets were mad, maddening, inconsistent, and you know, but every time they gave him the ball, great things were happening. We've seen that with Claypool. It was not like last week was the first time he popped up and did anything. Week one, he had that incredible sideline catch that I believe like next gen stats was saying was like the most improbable incompletion of the entire week. Week two, he has that 80 yard bomb for a score against the Broncos. Week three, he almost scored again against the Texans on this little fly screen. I mean, everything they're asking him to do is turning well, man. I again like I was saying this on one of their pods, but everyone out there that was saying this dude's a tight end, I really hope that analysis was finished with, and he's going to be the best tight end we've ever seen because my goodness, I mean, this dude, straight baller. So I do think the talent is going to win out. This is a passing game that, you know, Big Ben, lowest average target depth of his career. I think they've been looking for someone to be able to add this shoes, add these big plays. And while the snaps haven't been there yet, they're starting to trend in the right direction. Even with Deontay maybe coming back, man, like you just, come on, like Tomlin's a smart guy. You can't put your best player down and he's not going to be down as it is so I, I think uh, it's a situation where talent should win out and the workload isn't all that bad as it is so wide receiver three for now but get him on your roster because if you want someone if you need like worst case he is absolutely someone we can throw out there you know to cover up a, a, a buyer injury yeah quick quick question for you because this is a, a huge question today right so yeah. most people are doing their free agent you know moves tonight you know some leagues may have done them earlier but most leagues are still doing them tonight if at the latest, probably tomorrow night, but people, especially if you're in a fab league, right. Where you've got so much of your money, what percentage are you putting on Claypool? Because he's available in a ton of these leagues. I'm not going to be the guy that blows 50% plus on him. I like to reserve that just for the three down RBs of the world. When you know, they, they appear in that special handcuff. Uh, I would say more in that 20, 30% range. Maybe that means I'm not going to get him. I'm still high in the guy. I do think he deserves to be the number one ad of the week, but not someone I'm going to break the bank for. What about you? Yeah, I think we're, we're, we're aligned. I'm typically like you. I mean, it's funny, like Tiernis Johnson last week. Like I saw people literally, you know, I'm in, we, we covered this last time. Dwayne's in too many leagues. But, uh, <laughs> man, I saw so many people like blow the whole thing. So, uh, you know, we'll see. I, I know that in some of those leagues, Claypool's going to go for way more than what I'm willing to put on him. Thank goodness I've, I've rostered him on like four or five teams. So I've just got him sitting there. Um, but I'm with you. It's just, it's a... I might push it to 40% if I'm in a league, you know, where the format, you know, makes it worth it. And I know I really need a receiver, but I'm, I'm not going to probably go over the 50% mark. Yeah, I think that's fair. All right, Bengals at Colts. We got Indy opened up at minus nine and a half. That is down to uh, minus eight, 46 and a half game total, holding steady. So Joe Mixon, while his week, uh, you know, four blow up against the Jaguars was great. I actually thought last week, uh, you know, didn't put up the numbers, but his usage was actually, I think, more like better coming, moving forward than that big three touchdown performance uh, was because in a game that the Bengals like were never in, they lost 27 to three. In years past, this would be the game where Mixon and plays 50% snaps, has like one or two targets, and Giovanni Bernard is just on the field almost the entire second half. No, that is not what happened. 77% snaps for Mixon, only 23% for Gio. You know, Gio still did have the two targets, and he's still going to be out there in you know, more two-minute situations than we would like. But Mixon, seven targets. They seem to at least be trying uh, to, uh, to get him the ball a little more often in the receiving game, as they should. I mean, I, I, oh, I can't remember who did the awesome uh, Twitter video of showing the targets with the music between, uh, you know, Mixon and Gio Bernard. Uh, I, think gonna... Jay, I think it was Jay Moyer. That's right. Okay, yeah. Shout out Jay Moyer. That video was awesome. But that as Jay Moyer a... FB. Yes, fantastic stuff there. You know, hopefully Twitter continues to peer pressure the Bengals into using Mixon as the lead pass on back. And clearly at this point uh, in their careers, Mixon needs the ball in his hands far more than Gio. So, you know, I was saying today where, you know, we'll talk about the Chiefs in a bit, but I do think Claude edwards solaire is a prime uh, by low candor right now. And some people were kind of clapping back. Well, what about Joe Mixon? It's like, yeah, if you can still go out and get Mixon, I think it's fine because with this sort of, uh, you know, targets and snap share, we're looking at legit top five potential. I know the O-line still sucks, but again, the whole issue and the whole holdup of Mixon has always been not getting the pass down work that we know he can perform with. It's like Josh Jacobs. We know they can do good things as a receiver. It's just a matter of are they going to get it or not. Right now, Mixon is on pace for 384 touches on the season. You know, again, there's going to be weeks like last one. We just see the offensive line kind of stifle the entire offense with that sucks. But don't sleep on him popping off this week, particularly if, uh, you know, Darius Lunder remains sidelined with this 
groin injury. So Dwayne, am I, you know, am, I, I know you, you got the best utilization man, report I, I, in the I, I, game, I, man. Am I, am I off on Mixon and then hit me with the Colts? Man, I hate, dude, I hate this because I'm, it's funny. I'm, I'm here with everybody. I'm in the same boat and I get mistaken as a Mixon hater. Like people sometimes get so mad at me and I'm like, man, I'm just sharing information. It is not <laughs> me not liking Mixon. I like Mixon. I want Mixon to be the guy on the field. Um, personally to like Mixon, he's got some issues personally I don't like, but like as far as a fancy asset, like I, I clearly just like everybody else see that he's the better player. Unfortunately, this for me was a weird, 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 um, situation that, that really equaled Mixon having the outing that he did. Because if you look at it, even though to your point, they were trailing, they just didn't get in long down and distances, you know, a ton. And so what was happening is in their first and second, they were just targeting Mixon on first and second down because they just, to me, what it looked like is they basically wanted the game to be over and they didn't want Burrow to get hit anymore. So if you look at his long down and distance, you know, snaps this week, um, 9%. If you look at his two minute offense, 0%. So he's still, that's all still going to Geo. It was a situation, though, where it was like, oh, my God, if we let Burrow drop back and try to throw vertical down the field too much more, he could literally die. He may not make it to the next game. That's kind of the way I took it. So, But I'm with you. I want them to give the ball to Mixon more. I'm just not as optimistic because the things that typically support week, week in and week out, passing volume, you need to have one of those two roles yeah. because that's what insulates you from the game strip. So the other problem for Mixon, and I know I'm, I'm supposed to be moving on to the other team. The only you're other good, problem I see is he's only getting 35% of his targets on the first read, which isn't bad, but that's below uh, the average you know, for the NFL. So, I mean, for some of these other guys like Jacobs um, you know, and some of uh, – uh, gosh, I'm sorry, my mind's blanking. But anyway, Josh Jacobs is one of them where he doesn't get this long down and distance or two minute work either. But but John Gruden designs plays on um, first and second down where he's literally the first read. So those can be screen plays, they can be you know different things, rubs, different things that get your your back out into open space. And so Gruden does those things, whereas Zach Taylor is not doing those things you know for Joe Mixon. So I still think he's more dependent on on the rushing game than what most people are going to think because they see this trend of targets. Two, six, seven, and it's really, it's more, in my opinion, it's going to, and we'll see. We'll see what next week or in two weeks when we're back together, we'll take a look at Mixon again. I think it's probably a blip um, unless they truly change and just say, Geo, you and your mustache, you know, just go <laughs> sit down and uh, let's let Mixon handle this. Um, as far as the Colts go, um, man, talk about a back that's got to be frustrating because with Marlon Mack going down, not that we wanted Marlon Mack to be hurt, but pretty much everyone declared declared wow i took jonathan taylor in the third round and it's going to pay off huge you know it's jonathan taylor season and we've just got this scenario where it's like they don't want to truly unleash him ian and and it's kind of bothersome to me because this was a game where they really needed him to be good this was a game that was more competitive typically this season they've been blowing teams out by so much at the end of the game that's part of why you were seeing him leave the field and you had jordan wilkins coming in to salt things away so we kind of had the narrative of, well, they're just protecting him. They're holding him back. They're blowing out these teams. You know, they don't really need to use him. But in the two games where they've been in the most competitive scripts, you know, since Marlon Mack went down, he's seen 60 and 63% of attempts, which, which isn't terrible, but this isn't a super high volume offense. And they're just not getting involved, you know, in the passing game that much. He sees 0% of the two minute work and he sees about half of the long down and distance work, which makes him, you know, basically a 33% route guy, you know, at the end of the day. Um, you know, on average. So I'm worried about Jonathan Taylor officially because now we've seen two competitive scripts where he still didn't get the volume. You know, now in one of those games, they had so many plays because the other team couldn't hold the ball in week two that Taylor ended up with like 20 something carries. But in normal games where they can't just con- completely control it, if they're not leaving him in the game, you know, enough. He's not getting enough attempts. So that's really frustrating right now. Um, so I think Jonathan Taylor, you know, he's still, he's a low end RB2 right now. I mean, what are you going to do? You can't just, you can't sell the guy low. You're going to have to stick with him. Um, and you're just going to have, have to hope that something changes. Um, but right now it's not looking really good for Jonathan Taylor. Um, and I, I didn't get to watch this last week's game, but the couple of weeks before he just, you know, he definitely didn't look as a preseason, you know, training camp stuff where he was just running against people with no pads. 
<laughs> but I'm just, I'm not seeing, and maybe it's part of this is he's really still finding his groove, right, as an NFL runner, and maybe that's part of it as well. So the only other thing I'll say about the Colts is we were also waiting on another player to see what things would be like in a competitive game script, and that was T.Y. Hilton, and that totally went the other way. I mean, Hilton was a complete, you know, breakout from a utilization standpoint last week. You know, so the, the here were his snaps leading up to last week, 58%, 53%, and 75% over the last four weeks. And then last week was 95% of the snaps, 95% of the routes, 32% of the targets. Still didn't pay off with a huge day. Phillip Rivers is not looking great. But I think that's positive for you folks that do own T.Y. Hilton. You're probably thinking he's borderline droppable, and he really was kind of reaching that territory. But if they're in competitive games, you should feel good about T.Y. Hilton. I don't know that that's going to happen this weekend because against the Bengals, they could very easily be in another situation where you know they're winning by 21 headed into the fourth quarter, and you're just not going to see Hilton on the field a lot. So he's probably a guy you're going to leave on the bench if you can this week. I would say he's a low-end wide receiver this week, but you come out of the bye and you're going to get several competitive games. And at that point, I think you've got a wide receiver two on your hands. I agree with the eye test on uh, Taylor. Like he hasn't looked, you know, as the Saquon Barkley light player he was kind of hyped up to be uh, coming in this year. But maybe this Bengals game is the get-right spot that he and that entire run game needs. So quick shout-out to our sponsors at pristineauction.com. Check out their daily auctions with $1 starting bids on over 8,000 football items up for auction. Pristine Auction guarantees authenticity on every product. And make sure you use code PFF for $10 off your first invoice. We are currently giving away a signed Amari Cooper jersey through uh, our the fine folks at pristineauction.com rate and review the podcast and we will be choosing a winner uh this week or next week so pristineauction.com rate and review amari cooper jersey code pff what's not to love everyone all right moving on we got the ravens at the eagles baltimore is sitting at seven and a half point favorites uh game total about 48 and a half down 246 and a half so lamar jackson rushing usage not great he missed practice time in week five with a knee injury adam Schefter said don't worry everyone lamar jackson is fine he was out there doing his thing i mean even though he didn't have the rushing usage and truly uh, i mean only two design rush attempts that was his lowest mark since week one of 2019 lowest mark as a starter other than that week one game and if you remember that was when the ravens built a 42 to 10 halftime lead over the dolphins never i don't even think lamar had to leave the pocket that game for them to win uh by five touchdowns so this you know potentially was a situation like that i mean them playing the Bengals, not didn't exactly have to you know dive deep in their bag of tricks uh but it's a little bit concerning you know we've you've seen a little bit of a step back in the passing efficiency more than touchdown rate which was to be expected but if lamar isn't giving us that you know sky high world beating rushing floor we've never seen from the position before we can't keep treating him as the overall qb1 that's the change i've had to made this week dropped him all the way down to four so not like it's you're gonna be benching him or anything like that unless you're just completely uh blessed at the position and i do think it's very possible that week five was a blip on the radar but this week might not be that much different because they do have a week seven by you know the eagles okay they Wentz finally played a little bit okay last week but still erratic still a situation where you know i don't think any of us would be shocked if the ravens are able to build a big lead here so you know not a situation i'm going to be attacking in dfs until we see you know some sort of sign again that jackson is going to be back running a lot something to monitor for now again he was out there and i, I trust Schefter when he says you know the injury isn't anything too serious but uh definitely keep an eye on these rushing numbers because as you know lamar underrated passer like get your running back jokes out of here uh but you know if he doesn't have that rushing upside we're not gonna be able to treat him as the same just highest of high level options uh Dwayne, concerned about the rushing usage and then him with the eagles um, I'm less concerned about the rushing usage. I think it will come back. I don't think it's a serious injury, but I do think, to your point, that's that's definitely holding holding him down. Um, because what teams are starting to do is they're taking away the things that Lamar really likes to do. And we see this all the time with young quarterbacks. And now they've got to show, can they grow another level, right? So everybody had the film, everything on Lamar Jackson from last year. They, they figured out what are all the things he loves to do. How can we take away those things and still contain this Baltimore running game? which was the problem last year. So what Lamar Jackson, in my opinion, has to do is he has to show that he can hit the outside deep shots. And that's where he's missing. He gets a guy like Marquise Brown in a one-on-one -on -one matchup. Marquise Brown's getting open. And Jackson just isn't hitting him. You know, he just doesn't put enough arc on the ball. There's a lot of things he could do. Look, the guy's a pro quarterback. I think he can figure it out. But those are things that he struggled with in college as well. They're things that he struggled with in his rookie season when he got on the field. So it's not like this is a new issue for him. This has been there, and I think teams are forcing him to show you can actually do that. And if he can if he can figure that part out, I think everything unlocks again, right? That's like his cheat code. He needs to show that he can do that. Um, 
you know, as far as, you know, looking at the Eagles, man, it's like, <laughs> I don't know if you're, you know, you probably watch Major League. You're, you're younger than me, Ian. But it's Love like, that movie. Yeah, yeah. So Major League at the point where they're all at camp and they're like, who are these guys? Like, who is Tra- <laughs> who's Travis Fulgham? You know, I mean, who's, who's Jason Kroom, you know, who, I mean, who, we have no clue who most of these people are. Greg Ward, we, we found out last year, but I mean, you got to give Doug Peterson credit. Like he finds these guys somehow and they get something out of them. I think the key thing really to talk about with the Eagles is we just got to keep an eye on Deshaun Jackson and Alshon Jeffrey. What's going to happen? They're supposed to be coming back. You're going to have Jalen Rager. That's eventually going to enter back into the fold. I think the Eagles, despite all their offensive line problems, and they really have a lot, there was a consideration of even shutting down Lane Johnson. Sounds like they're not going to do that. They lost Jason Peters. They already lost their their uh, Pro Bowl guard you know, before the season even started. So there's, there's a lot of moving parts on the offensive line, and Carson Wentz is one of those guys that every game I wonder if he's going to survive because he's just like a, a ball of rolling knives. Like I, I don't even know how to explain it when he's moving, but it's like everything is so – like just like there's body parts flying everywhere and I'm like, oh man, he's just gonna die. But he, he he's managed not to so far. So if you're in a super deep league and you're playing in a quarterback flex, I would recommend picking up Jalen Hurts because he could very easily be playing soon. But I think the key here is just really the injuries. The only other thing I would say is Miles Sanders, man. Wow. I mean, able to actually come through against the Steelers, who haven't been as vaunted as we thought they were gonna be on D. They've had some mental lapses, some errors that are allowing teams to get some big plays. But Miles Sanders is the example of really, you know, that's the definition of what a true bell cow is. No matter what the script is, he's still intact for a fantasy play. And it's because of all the targets that he gets in the passing game. Um, it's because he can break a big play at, at any moment. Is he really the best, like, at reading defenses and blocking schemes and all those things? No, but he's an athlete. He only needs one play here or there, and he's getting all the work. So Miles Sanders, you just really have to feel really good about. Plus, he was coming off of a... Um, you know, injuries in the preseason. Then last week they were like, oh, he's got this glute issue or maybe it was a quad. I can't remember last week. Maybe it was a quad. He didn't look like any of that was bothering him. You know, so he, he's out there all the time. You have to feel good about Miles Sanders. And he can, and to me, he only has upside because as the offense can gel, improve, which it should as it gets healthy, unless they continue to have injuries, you know, Miles Sanders is going to be in really great shape. Yeah, and do not be that guy or girl out there that says, oh, you take away Miles Sanders' 75-yard run. He only had 10 yards on 10 carries or whatever. He made it happen. They make the big plays happen. Unless we are talking Bilal Powell falling down and the entire defense quitting on the play as he goes to the end zone, I do not want to hear any of these rate stats where you're removing the great plays. Great players make great plays. Lesser players don't. Quit taking away big plays and trying to somehow turn this argument on the player. So, okay, I'm done yeah, with man, that. Clay, uh, Chase Claypool should have scored zero touchdowns. If you just take away his touchdowns, you know, he didn't even <laughs> score. So, like, wh- wh- why are you going back to that guy? All right, Packers at Buccaneers. We got Green Bay. So, they started out as three-point underdogs, and now they're all the way up to one-and-a-half point favorites, officially crossing the line. Over-under is up from 52 to 54. And just Aaron Rodgers, like, oh, my goodness. I came to this epiphany with uh, Russell Wilson last week, too, it was like not like this guy's having a great season and we always knew like letting Russ cook uh, would be fantastic. But like Russell Wilson with more volume is literally putting up better efficiency numbers than he's ever done. He's the, you know, 30, he's the 40% three point shooter that got more uh, opportunities and is now inexplicably shooting 45%. Like it doesn't make sense that Russ can keep doing that. And Rogers is in the same wavelength pretty much because going in this year, no notable additions to anywhere on the offense, same, you know, scheme coming back. There was really nothing to get behind Aaron Rodgers bounce back year other than just hey it's Aaron Rodgers you know he's going to be good and now he's pissed off they drafted Jordan Love well like not only is he having this great year he is having a career year and previously that was 2011 but right now he has career high marks and completion rate touchdown rate hasn't thrown a pick just yards per attempt QB rating PFF passing grade everything this is the best version of Aaron Rodgers we have ever seen and that is absolutely amazing to me because even his number one receiver the one guy we knew could be out there Devontae Adams has hardly been healthy this entire season so you know all the credit to Rodgers he had the great line in the interview a couple weeks ago where he said you know even his down years are career years for other guys I get it you know I was one of the dweebs out there I picked the lines to win the NFC North you know uh, I'm you know I'm wearing my clown mask right now I get it but uh you know truly to expect Rodgers to have a career best year in 2020 I mean just just amazing credit to him for getting it done you know they have utilized play action at a top 12 rate uh second lowest pressure rate like I understand there's advanced metrics I hope describe why he has you know been able to take the step step up this year but I mean it's just amazing what he's done excited to continue to watch the league's highest scoring offense on the other side of the ball
football, though? Tom Brady and company, how are you feeling? Man, I feel okay about Brady. Obviously, he's got to get, you know, weapons back other than, you know, uh, it was just kind of a weird moment. It's like watching the champ fall, even though, like, you know, <laughs> Brady's not done. But, like, when he did the four thing, because he's such a brainiac, right? And we just, like, Tom knows everything. Tom's in control of everything. And when he did that, like, and I knew what he was doing immediately. I was just like, I was like, Floored. Like, now I didn't jump on Twitter. I didn't want to, like, lambast him. I mean, there was some really funny stuff. And to his credit, like, he used it, you know, this week. Yeah, in I his saw tweet that. to LeBron, which I thought was so freaking awesome. You know, that, it, you know, as serious as he is, he can, you know, laugh at himself. But I think Brady's going to be fine. I think what we're seeing, though, Ian, um, you know, now obviously the weapons are all hurt. You know, you lost O.J. Howard, you know, the week before. You've got Chris Godwin out. you got Mike Evans playing banged up. I, I, I think it's just you know, something where they're going to continue, even when those guys are back, they just, they spread it across everyone. There's no true target hog in this offense. Um, and I just don't know that we're going to see that, which is really, and again, we still got to get Godwin healthy. We got to get Evans healthy. Let's see what happens. But even in the games where they've been at least semi healthy together on the field, it's not like, you know, anybody's getting 30% of the targets or 25%. It's literally spread around like anywhere between 10, 15, 18, 19% across everyone. And so that's a bit concerning because it's just a situation where, is that really going to be enough? Now, what I will say is, you know, Brady is on pace, right? A lot of people thought that Brady, you know, this year that, oh, well, he's not going to throw for as many yards because the game scripts are going to change. Even though they've been leading and stuff, they're still happy to throw the ball. So the good news is they are, there is enough volume, you know, there, I think, that, you know, it can sustain these guys to at least being valuable in your lineup. I just don't think we're going to see some of, you know, I just don't think we're going to see, you know, some huge blow-ups like we thought where maybe we have two wide receivers finish up in the top six or eight like we did last year. I just don't see that in the range of outcomes at this point. Still valuable players to own, um, but it's just so spread around. Um, On Gronkowski, man, I just, I guess I'm done because last week, if there was ever a moment for Gronk really just to show that, look, I still got it. My team needs me. He just wasn't able to do it, and he just he doesn't. Now, maybe he's still working back into shape, but I would think, like, at this point, he would probably be in really good shape, and he had a year away from football. Like, he should feel the best I think he's felt, like, pretty much in, like, five or six years beyond, you know, age, catching up with him. And he just doesn't look like Gronk anymore. He doesn't look like this undefendable player. He looks average at best, and Brady just – you know, Brady's not forcing it to him. There were plays where Gronk was actually open. I mean, I see Gronk open and Brady's not going to him. So he's clearly, and and it's actually, you know, if you look at it again, that's part of this. There's no guy, no player on the bunk on the bucks that's seeing like, you know, 90% or 85 of their percent of their targets on a first look. Like he's literally going through his progressions, finding the right player, going to him, which goes to back to what we talked about, you know, a moment ago. The only other thing I'll say on the Bucks is Ronald Jones. Like, I don't know what he did to Bruce Arians or one of Bruce Arians' daughters. Or, <laughs> I don't know what the story is, but they do not like this guy. Like they just don't like, I mean, look at the, like last week, who was available? No one. Ronald Jones was really, that was it. Yet, they still gave him 0% of the two-minute offense. They gave him 0% of the long down and distance offense. They gave him 0% of the offense inside the five. He is literally, you guys ever go to dinner with your family or you remember when you were little and all the adults go to sit at the adult table and they're kind of like, yeah, Dwayne, go sit over there, you know, with, you know, your cousins at the... That Ronald Jones is stuck with the cut with his cousins, like at the kid table. He's not allowed. He's not allowed to come to the adult table with Brady and Arians and all the other guys. Like literally, he's stuck over there, and they're just not gonna let this guy do his thing. It's I just you know as, as soon as the rest of these backs get healthy, it's just gonna be a nightmare. Honestly, if you can move Ronald Jones for anything right now, just do it. Just just get it over with, and you know what? You can bombard my DMs with what an evil person I am when he goes off and he wins the league rushing title. He's been running well, man, but I'm with you. I think as soon as uh, Fournette is healthy, he's going to come back and make this yeah. a three-RB time share. Get that confidence up, Rojo. He had that. It should have been a touchdown. He rolled into the end zone, and the ref was, like, incomplete, and Rojo's like, yep, you know, flip the ball away. It's like, <laughs> bro, you he's caught like, the ball. act like a winner. Come on, Rojo. You caught hey, man, the ball. I was a Rojo like truther it. early on. I, admittedly, I liked him coming out of college, and I stuck with him, you know, the next year. But then as the more I watched him, I was just like, man – 
and I'm with you. He's looked good running the ball. Like he's running the like with power is what I see and determination, and I really like it. But there's something going on. I think again, we can't make these. We're not on the inside of the building. This is not me trying to be a prick. But I think there's. I feel like there's something going on like with him up here to where they're just like, man, we don't we we don't trust you in that situation. We'll let you do these things, but there's no way we're letting you do these do these other things. Yeah. I mean, at some point, if Arians was going to fully feature someone, I think we would have seen it by now. Uh, moving on, Rams at 49ers. Got the Rams sitting as three-and-a-half-point favorites. Game total staying steady at 49-and-a-half. So the Rams, you know, just <laughs> – if, if, if you've been able to figure out this Daryl Henderson puzzle this year, credit to you because it has just been a disaster. Uh, week one and week four went to Malcolm Brown. Week two, three, and five uh, went to Daryl Henderson. And then we got Cam Akers who had a really nice 46-yard run, which, by the way, when you watch this run also pay attention to Montez Sweat who somehow chased Akers down from behind uh, you know the fact that dude can run a 4-4 out 260 pounds is not brought up nearly enough but anyway Cam Akers you know nice run looked good out there looked fully recovered from the rib injury and everything and it got Sean McVay after the game to say you know you can expect his workload to increase now I know that's been the line going around Twitter and everything about oh you know Cam Akers week coming up no everyone this is this, this is just now instead of an annoying two-back committee it's an annoying three-back committee McVay has pretty much stuck to what he said in the summer, he likes all the backs they have. They're going to continue to go with the hot hand as the game progresses. So, you know, at some point, Akers is going to get his rub. One of these weeks, it's going to be Cam Akers week. But, you know, it's also looking like the dreaded 33-33-33 split that, you know, we're pretty much going to see in Tampa Bay as well. So, there's worse guys to throw out there when we're going to have these bye weeks and injuries and someone getting, you know, double-digit touches in this offense. And, you know, it's a, it's a they all have a chance on any given week. It's just going to be a total pain to try to predict that. You know, in this matchup, I'm not, you know, loving it. But, hey, against that banged up front seven, I think they could certainly take advantage of it. Just not a situation, I think, where we can confidently rank anyone inside the top 20, 24 backs. And it doesn't really look like we're going to be able to anytime soon. Uh, Dwayne, what's up with the 49ers? Yeah, man, rapid fire because there's a few things to hit here on the 49ers. Number one, really positive thing. Debo Samuel, 89% of the routes, which was up from 34% the week before. So he looks to be fully integrated, at least from a standpoint of being on the field. Also saw 24% of the targets, which was eight. And that's that's very positive for that really being just his second game back. You know, let's hope Debo can stay healthy. But right now, all signs point to Debo's probably going to be a wide receiver two, wide receiver three in that range for the rest of the season. Um, Ayuk, as a rookie, still continues, you know, Ian, to see a ton of playing time. He was out there for 96% of the routes. You know, I think what you're going to see is a little bit of an alternating situation between those two guys. Um, Kittle's always, of course, going to get his. But the thing is, like, the 49ers defense is no longer this vaunted, immovable object. So if you get into shootouts with the Niners, the positive for fantasy is you could have an offense that could feed all three of these guys. Whereas before you couldn't because, you know, their play volumes were going to be low. The plas- the passing volume was going to be low. And so you were hoping, wow, man, four or five targets each. Hope one of them scores a touchdown. More like you feel really kind of around the Vikings offense. You don't have that with the Niners offense. Now, they've got to figure out their quarterback situation. they got to get that squared away. But I feel really good about both of those guys. I think they're both, you know, going to they, – they could alternate between a wide receiver two, wide receiver three. You're going to have your wide receiver four weeks out of those guys. But, you know, for the most part, especially in deep leagues, you're going to have them in your lineups, you know, moving forward. Um, and then the last thing here is McKinnon. McKinnon really just became a zero. I mean, going from literally getting everything the week before to Mostert comes back, and he got sent over to Rojo's table. He's now sitting at the kids' table. Only, and this isn't a this isn't a game where they're getting blown out, man. If there's ever a game where McKinnon's going to be valuable beyond you know an injury to the starter, I would figure it'd be this one because he's the guy they want to have on the field in the two minute offense, 100 percent third down and fourth down, seven plus yards to go, 100 percent of those snaps as well. Yet he was only able to be out there for 16 snaps on the game. What does that tell us? That literally those are the only snaps that he's getting. He's not in the normal running back rotation. Um, Raheem Mostert was still held back a bit as well. He's really going to probably end up falling into that range, kind of like a Jacobs, you know, a Mixon type. He's not going to get those, um, you know, passing options because McKinnon is the guy in that. And then he's going to have a guy spell him like Jeff Wilson a little bit, which slightly puts him below those others. But you drafted him most likely in the fifth or sixth round of your fantasy draft. So if you're going to end up needing to plug him in your lineup over the next couple of weeks, you're probably going to feel fine considering the price that you paid for him and all the other injuries that are going around the league. You know, he's probably a welcome sight. So I think, you know, most back in the mix, you know, as a low end RB2, you know, he's going to have his weeks where he's more like an RB3. 
Yeah, Mostert and McKinnon, just them, we could live with that. And McKinnon could make that work. But the fact that Wilson is still staying involved, even though he wasn't the week before, confusing but unfortunate, yeah. man. We, we, yeah, we cannot trust McKinnon uh, right now as long as Mostert is healthy. Uh, three more games, everyone. Thank you all for sticking with us here. We got the Chiefs at the Bills, Kansas City, three-point favorites. Game total at 55. Happy me, Cole Hardman season, everyone. It is time. Sammy Watkins expected to be out for a bit with his hamstring injury. We have what we have asked for, and that is one injury to this wide receiver room and Miko Hardman is going to have a near every down snap roll. So, you know, I, l- last season I made this, you know, just a little metric playmaker rate where I kind of weighted, you know, chunk gains of 20 plus yard passes, 15 plus yard rush and scores. I just weighted those, you know, about the whole touch to try to see who's just making the most big plays. Miko Hardman among 214 players with at least 30 touches, the number one guy. I mean, didn't quite have, you know, only 41 targets. So usually that 50 target threshold didn't get on that leaderboard. But if you want to do a funky target threshold, he's literally the most effective efficient uh, rookie wide receiver we've seen in the last 30 years just in terms of yards poor targets so situation where okay I understand Demarcus Robinson is also going to be out there on the field full-time but don't get this twisted everyone Miko Hardman is the second best playmaker in this wide receiver room he has been you know credit to Watkins you know if it's the playoffs or week one the guy goes and does his thing and he balls the hell out but he's out of the picture it's now Miko we already saw the snap spike last week this is what we've been waiting for if you have Miko Hardman still on your roster as I've been you know trying to tell people to keep him because he truly is maybe the only single wide receiver handcuff in the league. This is what I've been waiting for. We are starting him. You know, Bill's secondary. I think they'll play better as the year goes on. I don't care. Miko Hardman, as long as Patrick Mahomes is under center and Miko Hardman is starting, he should be in your starting lineup. I think great days are ahead. Dwayne, what's up with the Bills? Uh, quickly on Hardman. Yeah, I think he's a strong, you know, wide receiver three play. I think the only thing that's you know holds him back honestly from being on the field even more I don't see him probably getting over the 70 percent which by the way folks 70 percent of the routes with the Chiefs is fine (laughs) because they're a super efficient (laughs) offense you know yeah you'd love him to be at 80 or 90 but with the skill set Hardman brings I'm totally in alignment you know with with Ian you're gonna you're still looking for the big play he's not gonna get peppered with eight or ten targets but he just needs to be out there enough that there are a few more chances for him to pop open Mahomes sees him hits him you know, you're in for a big day. Um, so I, I, I like Hardman. I think he just gets limited a bit because he is a terrible run blocker. <laughs> and I think the better, in which we would never want this, but I think the true guy that if he went down would be Tyreek Hill would be where Hardman would really absolutely benefit the most. So he's still going to see some Demarcus Robinson. But like you said, um, it's hard to keep him off out of your lineup at this point because, you know, he's going to be the third best option in their passing game. You're still going to have Kelsey. You're going to have Hill. But this is a balanced offense too, like we, what we talked about with the Bucks. you know. And four, five, six, seven targets in this offense can be worth a lot, and you folks don't need us to tell you that. Um, as far as the Bills go, I was actually just looking, trying to see what's going on here. They've got 10 points tonight. Um, man, I don't, I don't have anything that i got to go into deep. You know, Ian, I know, you know we got to move on to the next team. But, I mean, basically, look, if you own Bills, you start them. You're just going to have to watch for, you know, Zach Moss. If he eventually comes back, you know, that's going to hurt Devin Singletary. But right now, Singletary's been the guy. Um, he's, he's making people miss. He's doing his thing. He's not great down inside the five. But, man, the guy's workload looks really good. So he's a guy that you're happy to own. And as, as draft season went along, he was falling, you know, into the seventh, eighth rounds of drafts. I got him a couple of times pretty late. And I feel fine about it. You know, we'll see what happens with Zach Moss whenever he comes back. Yeah, hopefully Singletary keeps, you know, that not maybe 80, 90%, but he should be a league guy. I think he's earned that. Hasn't played great ball all season. Uh, one more quick shout out to our sponsor before we get to these last two games. Uh, Monkey Knife Fight. Put Go to Monkey Knife Fight, put at least $20 in their account while using promo code PFF, and you will receive a free PFF Edge annual subscription, $40 value for just 20 bucks. And you can use that 20 bucks to make even more money playing daily fantasy and prop games. I one of the fastest growing fantasy sports sites in the USA in Monkey Knife Fight. So go to Monkey Knife Fight, deposit your $20, promo code PFF, Go make some more money and enjoy a PFF Edge annual subscription. All right, uh, Monday night game. We got a Monday night doubleheader going on next week. Cardinals at Cowboys. Uh, Another game that is the line has swung, you know, from one favorite to another. Cardinals opened as three-point dogs. Now they are two-and-a-half point favorites. Uh, Over-under is up from 52 to 54-and-a-half. So, you know, 
If you got Kyler Murray, you're starting him. You got De- DeAndre Hopkins, you're starting him. That's great. The backfield is the spot that remains muddled. And unfortunately, people, it's almost like worse than ever at this point because Chase Edmonds is truly starting to get not standalone value, but he's really taken over the pass game work. I mean, last week was the first time all season that Edmonds did actually run more routes than Drake. We've been seeing him get more targets as, as it is, and, you know, that wasn't great. But the whole, you know, idea behind loving Drake this year was the reality that all the Cardinals did last season was use one back, whether that was Drake, Edmonds, or David Johnson. They used one back uh, during the week, and now they're using two. So Drake, you know, last week still had 18 carries, one target. Kyler took pity on him at one point and gave him a goal line carry that he was able to punch into the end zone. So, you know, he's not useless, but I think the, uh, you know, the pipe dream that Drake could really put this together and you know, force his way in that top 10, top five range, that's over because now we're looking at, you know, a legit, almost like a, a poor man situation of like Josh Jacobs or Joe Mixon where not only are the targets not coming, but they don't seem to, you know, be coming at all and they're not really making an effort to get him the ball in the receiving game. So, you know, 15 to 20 touches per game in the Cardinals. At some point, uh, Drake's going to have, you know, some better weeks, but definitely someone we need to push much closer to that RB2 borderline. And then this is your weekly reminder to please pick up Drake and any, not Drake, pick up Edmonds in any fantasy league uh, that you can see him available because he is one injury away to Drake from being a potential weekly top 10 top 12 fantasy option Dwayne what's up with oh man Andy Dalton and company man my heart goes out I am a Cowboys fan but like just anytime you see a player have that kind of injury you know Dak obviously it speaks very loudly you know about what kind of human being he is when you see all the players come out and support him you know people know you know that Dak is really a good guy he's a huge person in the community here you know so I, I was just man I, honestly like I didn't even watch the game for like the next 15 minutes I was cooking out on the grill and I just I went out there and just drank my beer and cooked my food you know for the family it was just man I felt terrible for him yeah. um, but as far as fantasy impact you know I think Dalton's gonna be he's gonna have his wife he's gonna have his quarterback one weeks I think he'll be a fringe quarterback one you know for the season here's the deal with Dalton Dalton can be a turnover machine. That was the thing that Dak, you know, one of the things that makes Dak really good is that he just doesn't turn the ball over. Yeah, he does a lot of other things really well, but he's not somebody that, you know, throws a lot of picks. He doesn't get, a, I mean, he'll occasionally hold the ball too long and he'll get a, you know, a strip sack. Andy Dalton really likes to lock on to his first read. He needs his first read to be open. Um, if not, you know, he's a pick six city. And so this is going to be an issue. I think they're going to still have to rem- to, to drop back and pass. I think what they're going to try to do, Ian, I think they will try to slow the offense down, you know, some. If you look at it this last week, they only dropped back to pass 53% of the time. Now, part of that was because they actually got to be in a close game. They only trailed 32% of snaps last week, whereas on the on the season, um, you know, they've trailed over 66%, you know, of the, or sorry, 62% of the snaps they've, they've trailed. Um, they've got offensive line problems. Tyron Smith is now on the IR. Lael Collins was already put on the AR, so they don't have their tackles. They lost their center before the season started. Um, they lost their backup center this last <laughs> week. I mean, really, Zach Martin, like, is it. That, that's the last man standing on the offensive line. Um, you know, Connor Williams just has not been a good draft pick out of the University of Texas. You know, he's a really fast, athletic guy, but he just he's getting canned at the line. Um, so it's going to be problematic, man. You know, um, Dalton's going to have to show that he can manage the pocket, and I think there's going to be games where he's just not going to be able to, and he's going to get destroyed. I don't think this is one of those weeks, though. I think this is the week you get him in your lineup. I think he will be a QB1 this week. 356 plays by the Cardinals, 386 plays, number one in the league by the Cowboys. This is going to be, this This could be the game, Ian. This game will probably, it has a shot to be the game that has the most plays in it all year. <laughs> we'll see. I do think the Cowboys are going to try to slow things down some if they can keep the game manageable. The problem is their defense completely sucks. So we'll have to see. If they are able to slow things down, though, they go a little bit more to Zeke. Um, you know, if the defense can somehow hold up, they're trying to shorten games. I think we could see them try to do that. That could that's going to be problematic for the receivers because really they've been rotating four or five guys. Yeah. Um, now it's not been an issue. You're still you know so eighty percent of the routes is typically where Lamb is sitting. You know he's somewhere in the seventies. Amari's usually right above the eighty. Gallup is the guy that typically doesn't come off the field, but he's also the deep. You know, he's the field stretcher, and you can't ever throw to him because there's not any blocking. So he never gets targeted. Now, Dalton did hit him on, you know, a really nice pass down the field. Um, so there's a chance maybe he, he gets a connection going, you know, with Andy Dalton. But we got to keep an eye out if they are able to slow the offense down and still, 
you know, if they're, and again, this depends on the defense, but if they do slow things down, that is going to hurt the volume, you know, for these receivers because they've been living off the fact that, you know, you're running 75 to 80 plays a game. Yeah, just like with a, you know, if when a running back gets hurt that we can't assume the RB2 is going to walk in that same role, we can't assume this offense is going to look the exact same with any Dalton or so. And McCarthy's been very upfront about that pace and saying, you know, they just want to outscore everyone. Probably going to take a different approach now that, you know, the Red Rocket, Red Rifle, whatever you want to call them, is under center. So I just Definitely don't think... Definitely Red <laughs> I've been trying to push that one for years. Uh, it is a situation where, yeah, O-line problems and the potential for a lower pace and volume, like, it's... Dude... Andy Dalton's best season ever in 2015. He was a QB 11. I just have a hard time thinking that 2020 is all of a sudden going to be the best year of Dalton's career. Maybe if the O-line was still there and, you know, we had a situation where he had been on the team uh, for more than, what, four months. But I just don't think it's a situation that uh, is going to be all that conducive to the consistent fantasy success. But as you pointed out, if there is going to be a week where it's going to work out just fine, it probably will be this Monday night. Last one here, we got the Broncos at the Patriots. Wasn't able to spot a line for this one yet. So on the Broncos, you know, not the week you really want to be putting up Judy or Tim Patrick. And honestly, like if you don't start a single Bronco across fantasy formats of all shapes and sizes this week, I would not blame you. I know, you know, we'll see if Stefan Gilmore's back. Patriots front seven maybe isn't the same group of world beaters as it is. But this Broncos team, I mean, even if Drew Locke comes back and gives them some sort of spark, I think we're looking at one of the worst teams in the league at the moment. Just injuries all over the place. Both lines, uh, you know, skill position, talent, it's not there. So M- Melvin Gordon, he's been the one that's still kind of been producing. But even then, guys, I think it's a about to go away because Gordon without Philip Lindsay involved and it does look like Lindsay is probably going to be back uh, this week from that turf toe without Lindsay Gordon's been dominating 80% plus snaps you know getting 20 plus uh, touches per game but with Lindsay in, in there I truly think we're going to see more of a best case 60-40 split in favor of Gordon worst case you know straight up 50-50 it was trending towards that straight up 50-50 before Lindsay went down uh, in week one so again this is a true bottom five team in the league uh, in all likelihood I don't think we should be lining up to play Really, any of these guys uh, under these circumstances. Thoughts on the Patriots? Man, I really feel the same about the Patriots. Um, yeah. I think Cam <laughs> is it, right? You know, Cam's the guy you're going to play this week. He, he's the, really the only Patriot in my mind right now, um, you know, assuming he's back, that you can pretty much play every single week. Cam is it. Like, Edelman's still going to be dependent on you need a shootout because the Patriots, like what you just talked about, right, you know, with the Cowboys – now that the Patriots have changed, you know, and they really kind of started to make this change last year because they didn't have the weapons, but they wanted to lean more, you know, on their defense. They wanted to use the running game, some of those other things. And so I think you're just going to continue to see that. And this is not going to, this doesn't set up well, you know, for a situation where you have an offense good enough to really challenge them. And Bill Belichick's shown us, man, like, yeah, he's willing to keep the pedal down and just blow teams out when he's got an elite offense, but he's also shown us that he's willing to win a game that he should win by 21 by three. He doesn't care. He just wants to do what he needs to do to win the football game. He doesn't care about us as fantasy owners. I think Cam is always squarely within those plans because he's literally all they have. But Edelman's a guy that I don't want in any lineups this week. I don't even like Nikhil Harry anymore. He just doesn't look good. They're running out of ways to use the guy. Um, Again, I don't want to fall. I don't want to totally sell out too soon, you know, in dynasty, but in season long, you know, I'm good. I'm I'm fine. Moving along. Um, Damian (laughs) Harris, unfortunately, you know, you add cam back in Damian Harris got his 100 yards last week. And had they played that Monday night game with cam out, that would have been the probably the biggest chance for Damian Harris to have a huge game this year. But now you get cam back. Um, even last week, they didn't give Damian Harris carries inside the 20. They gave those to Burkhead. They didn't give him, you know, the long down and distance with the two-minute work. They gave that to James White. Um, and now you're going to have Cam back, and he's going to be the guy inside the five that's at least going to get half those looks, if not 60 to 70%, which now makes Damian Harris a guy that you can't even hardly use. If you got a bye week and you're just like, you know, you're in a super deep league and you're just like, I have to have somebody to put in Dwayne, fine. You can get Damian Harris in there, but I would much rather take a wait-and-see approach um, with him as a player, especially as far as my fantasy lineups go. Cam VP or bust everyone i am with you there all right everyone that is going to do it thank you as always for listening to the pff fantasy football podcast thank you Dwayne, uh, for coming on always enjoy our bi-weekly episodes man follow Dwayne on twitter at Dwayne mcfarland you'll see his name there context matters and Dwayne, uh U- U- utilization report out wednesdays yeah dude man I, I pff george you guys don't follow him make sure you give him a follow on uh on twitter because He's got me set up, man. So now I get this data sooner. He sends it to me first thing uh, really, really early on Monday. So I get up before my regular job. I take a look at it, kind of get my ideas. Then Monday night, I pound it out and write it. So I turned it in last night. 
and the guys published it today. So it's on the website, ready to rock. On the website right now, everyone, go check that out. All the great stats you heard Dwayne represent throughout the uh, episode are going to be right there. So thank you, Dwayne. Thank you, George. Thank you for listening to this episode of PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm Ian Harditz, and until next time, take care, everybody. Thanks for watching the PFF YouTube channel. And if you want to subscribe, all you have to do is push the button. Don't forget everything you get. A little fantasy, push the button. A little green line for the gambling aspects of the game, push the button. College football, push the button. The YouTube channel from PFF.